Hi, today on the bench I've got two Pioneer component system pieces. One is a double cassette deck, a CTW601R, and the bottom one here is a laser disc player, CLD2600. Now, I picked these up from a local antiques place for 20 bucks a piece. That's Australian dollars too. Um, and they're completely unknown. They were gotten from a uh, estate. Uh, and yeah, let's uh, dive in and see if I got a deal or if I have to work for my bargain. Okay, so here are the units. Now, uh, as I noted, they are both Pioneer, um, and they did come from an estate sale where the, yeah, completely unknown. Um, he also had a TV and amplifier unit that went with them, but they were they sold by the time I got there. Just these two remaining. I can't believe no one picked up the laser displayer, but uh, yeah, I don't know. Maybe I'm the only idiot that's interested in this. Uh, in the suburbs, but let's have a look at this. So they do look kind of grubby. They've got just it's kind of like just dirt and almost mold. There's some stickies on here that's kind of grubby. Uh, I can see one of the buttons down here. This B is completely busted in. It looks like it's taken a hit and it doesn't press. It needs to click, but this one doesn't. Um, I haven't powered them on. They do have just the standard Australian plugs, although this one looks kind of different. This is the laser disc and this is the tape deck. Um, and I've just noticed that we've also got a bonus in here. <laughs> War of the Worlds. Part two, not even part one. There we go. It'll be a good test to see if that'll work. I'm gonna guess that the uh, belts in both the cassette drives are cactus by this point. But um, yeah, I reckon let's just give them some power and see what we get. All right, nothing exploded. We got a power on off. Ooh, look at that. Okay, so well, let's just try playing. Yeah, all I can hear is just belt slipping, and I can see that there's absolutely no movement, and it's detected that there's, yeah, it's not getting anywhere. Uh, yeah, okay. Uh, detects that there's no cassette, and it won't do anything, that kind of sucks. No, same thing. Yeah, no movement at all. Okay, I'll forward rewind. No, you can even hear it clicking. Yeah, it's giving up, but, I mean... Yeah, it looks like it's working. We've got Dolby. It's changing the interfaces. EQ. Hmm. This looks like we have a go. I might just need to pull this apart. Uh, give the he the heads and the the, uh, the playback heads a uh, service. Replace the belts. And I mean that just just looks like it works. So that's awesome. Okay. Laserdisc, so yeah, uh, you can see kind of on top it's a little bit dirtier, the labels are falling apart. This is also the big um, double unit, so by that I mean with the Laserdisc you would normally have to play side one, eject, swap over, put side two in and play. This has the extra box at the back, I believe, where it's a double double side unit where the the actual sled that the laser assembly goes is goes all the way back and then rotates and then comes back to play the other side without having to you know, get up from the couch and, and change it over, so it'd be kind of cool if this works, or if we can get it working even. Ooh, big spark. Oh, we got a standby light. Okay. And nothing. Just flashes. Hmm. No. And I don't have the remote control for this, so I can't even issue remote commands. Actually, I might be able to. I wonder if I have my old Samsung phone that has the infrared. Like, one of the earlier galaxies had an infrared sensor, and there were apps that you could use to, to use it as a remote control. Um, yeah, let me see if I can dig that out and see if we can get that working. Yeah, well, found it, but... Dead, dead as attack. Uh, I can't remember which galaxy this is, but yeah, you can see it's got the little infrared sender on the top. Guess I'll uh, give that a wait and see if we can get it powered up. Well, I couldn't get my uh, 
phone working. I don't think the battery's <laughs> living anymore, but I was able to free up this little button here, and unfortunately, that uh, didn't have any impact. <laughs> I doubt it would, but I noticed that if I do hold down any one of these buttons, you can see the light doesn't flash like it does when nothing is held. So, uh, but yeah, no, can't see anything wrong. So, uh, let's um, let's unplug it and dive in and see what we've got. Effect screws. Okay, should just be able to lift the top off now. Oh, yeah, there we go. Four. That's a beaut. Look at that. Huh. No disc in there, which is interesting. Yeah, and there's the, um, like I said, the rotating mechanism. It's really kind of cool how it works. So like we have so the uh, output, input, output boards. So that's a SCART port at the back there. And then some more mechanisms underneath this. Looks very complicated. I think for starters, I'm just going to try and take this entire sled mechanism out so that I can uncover uh, everything underneath. It does kind of look like the top part comes off with just a handful of screws, and then the, the lens assembly and everything comes off later. So let's give that a shot. Spindle. Mm. Very greasy. Oh, actually, what am I doing? Let's put that back together. Just realized how to get that out. I should be able to take the spindle plate off here. Maybe not. If I can hold it steady. Thing up. Okay. I think at this point I need to remove the front because that whole mechanism is together. So there's one on the side here. And then a couple up the top here. Separated. Well, I got the uh, caddy, the, the drive tray out. Um, I'm not going to go into the detail on how I did that because it was embarrassing and an absolute mess. The, uh, the service manual says in order to remove the drive tray, you have to turn it on, press the eject button, and then there's just a couple of screws. But obviously, that doesn't work, so I had to finagle and remove a whole bunch of other stuff. Anyway, now that it is open, we can immediately spot a glaring problem. This capacitor, this looks like a super cap. Um, big fat round stubby things. Uh, very, very looking corroded. Um, yeah, I think that would possibly be our fault just in general if that's gonna be drawing too much or whatever, I'm putting the power supply into current protect. 
who knows. So I think I want to continue tearing uh, the whole sled assembly out um, and get that mainboard out. boy. You may have to work in situ. Hmm. Where did that come from just now? Interesting. Well, what we're looking for here is this component down here, these two legs. So let me uh, let me just extract that really quickly. Five volt. I guess we could try turning it on without, but uh, I don't know what it's for. <laughs> Let's actually go and have a look at the schematics. Okay, so here we are with the uh, Pioneer service manual for the CLD 2600. 
Uh, I've gotten this PDF from the Laserdisc database website. Really cool resource for Laserdisc, Laserdisc stuff. Um, but yeah, now I've already scoped this out and done a little bit of research. We want to go to page 27 and this is the ASCB board assembly. I don't know what ASCB stands for. It stands for something Laserdisc related. I don't know. Um, but if we actually look at the next page, which has the full um, kind of like overview drawing and there's the reverse on the other side on the next page. This is layout of the PCB and you can see this circle right here, that is our super capacitor, the one farad capacitor that we removed. If we zoom in a bit there, we can see that it is C935. So now if we go back up to the schematic page, we will be able to find that down in the bottom corner here. Now, as you can see, this is C935 right there. Uh, one farad, 5.5 volts. Um, and, you know, I don't fully understand exactly what this is doing. I stared at it for a little bit and we'll go into that in a, a bit detail. But we can see that it has some voltage inputs, goes to ground, and then one line comes off and feeds up into this FCS drive. I don't know what FCS drive is. Um, focus drive? I'm, I'm really not sure. And it goes to the CNNB assembly. It's a connector that goes elsewhere on the board. Uh, we could look that up, but yeah. Uh, and we can see that that comes across here, uh, goes into some other resistors and capacitors and more circuitry down here. And there is also this FCS driver. So maybe it's like the focus, you know, holds the little laser in focus does that drive and then it's connecting up to there to do something. I'm not 100% sure. I just don't know. Um, but like I said, I had a look at this schematic and what we're thinking about here is what this capacitor could impact and I could not figure it out. So what I did was I drew it up in uh, every circuit, which is a kind of like a spice simulator that I like to use. The only things that I've done differently is I've added a switch to the voltage supply. So we've got our 14 volts. That is what this, these two lines here mean. Because if you scroll all the way up, you can see where those voltages come in and the 14 volts is the double arrow. What happens is the, the 14 volts comes up through here, goes through this resistor, 3.3K, um, and then this Zener diode here, um, based on the part number, is uh, has a breakdown voltage of 6.2 volts, which means that the voltage coming out of here uh, is approximately 6.2, so 6.14, goes through this uh, NPN diode and then uh, ends up being 5.54 volts, which is dangerously close to the 5.5 volt rating of the one farad capacitor to begin with, so that's... Mm. Um, but then it kind of goes across here and then at the output here we can see if we look at our uh, this is a volt volt meter i'm measuring the output voltage here and we've got about 3.36 volts going out now what happens when we turn the system off so the theory with the supercapacitor is they hold that one farad holds that charge for a very long time they're commonly used as like um, backup capacitors or like like temporary batteries almost. Um, I know the Xbox, the original Xbox uses a one farad uh, super capacitor to keep the real-time clock alive, you know, when you've got it unplugged for a decent amount of time. Um, so if we turn the power off, what happens is that that one farad capacitor then starts feeding the same circuit. And we can see that we did get a large a sharp drop in the thing, but it's actually only down to four point, you know, just over four volts. It is going down quickly, but it's still holding a decent voltage. And if we turn that back on, you can see it shoots back up to, you know, 4.3 volts almost immediately. Now, what I also did was I added a little switch here so we can take that capacitor out of the circuit. Now, if we flip the power off again, so we're pressing the power button on the front of the unit, we can see that voltage immediately drops to zero. So this one farad capacitor, I believe, and like I said, I don't, fully understand what the circuit does or what it's there for but I believe that is there as kind of like a backup power supply for whatever this focus drive pin uh, uses. Now in our case I just want to know if taking it out or if that capacitor being shorted would cause a problem. Uh, now I just checked that that capacitor it, it's actually not shorted it's gone completely open so it hasn't failed in a short and can we live without it? And I think in this case, I think we can. I think it's there as a backup mechanism for something, um, whether that's to make sure that the focus sled can, you know, set back to a home position, something like that, 
or, I don't know, back up, really. Point being, <laughs> uh, I think we can get, a, get away without using it for now. Uh, and I will just make sure to order one for the future before I button this up and, uh, you know, put it in its everyday home. So, uh, yeah, that was a fun little excursion into, you know, the circuit. It's really interesting design. I still, if anyone has any idea better than me, um, I'd be, I'd love to hear what this is actually here for. <laughs> I really have no idea, but it looks like a backup circuit, backup power for something. Uh, but yeah, now let's get back to it, getting the unit working. As we can see on the schematics, I don't think this is vital. I think it's just a helper um, for the focus drive. I can't, I don't know, no idea what that is. But um, yeah, I've got the front panel back in and just the internals all plugged back in. Uh, let's see what happens if we plug it in and turn it on now. I'm not expecting much. Okay, yeah, we've still got the standby light. And exactly the same, yeah. So, oh, you know, I can actually hear some clicking coming from the power supply side. It's like a very high frequency. Almost sounds like inverter noise, not inverter noise. Like switch power, switch my power supply noise. Interesting. So maybe there's some power supply issues down the back here that we need to um yeah pay attention to so i think that's my next port of call pulling out that power supply and seeing what we get or at least uh trying to identify some um test points that i can check if we've got voltages and whatnot coming out of it hmm. uh, now we're looking for uh this is connector 315 which is this one right down in here and we'll be looking for pin 8 is ground and then we'll check uh, four should be plus five volts. Let's plug it in. I'm being very careful because this is now mains hot. And check pin eight here. And sorry, six <laughs> and pin four. And we do indeed have five volts, so that's good. And we should have minus 30 on pin two. Which is outside the range that I've got set to. So let's go back to auto. Yes, minus 30, good. And then we'll have minus 5, so 2 should be minus 5. No. Interesting, okay. And we should have plus five here. No. Okay, so we do have 14 and we have minus 14. Yes, so the five volt is being really weird. It's not AC, is it? Yes, there we go, AC, five volts. That doesn't make sense at all. Why is that showing up as AC when it is a minus and plus five volt rail? Huh.
Okay, well I've got the board out and I have the schematics and I highlighted the path of the circuit that I was about to look through. Uh, we've got the switched 5 volt and minus 5 there. Um, we've got the power, the transistor and everything. And I was going to go through all of that. And then while I was just doing a visual inspection on this board, I noticed that we've got a lot of what looks to be corrosion on the backside here and here. And um, there's some more somewhere else. Where is it? Up here as well. So these three patches of corrosion also happen to be directly underneath the three identical capacitors. These are 470, 10 microfarad, uh, 10 volt, 470 microfarad, 10 volt, one, two, three of them. And those three are the only areas that there's, it looks like corrosion on the bottom. So I think we might just be looking at leaked electrodes. So I'm gonna at least pull this one, which looks like the biggest patch of corrosion out. This one's in like a pile of glue there as well, so that'll be a bitch to get out. But let's get this one out, give it a test and see if we've got a dead, uh, dead cap on our hands and if that's as simple as it is. Hmm. Yep. Oh, and I can immediately smell the uh, cooked electrolytic in the air. No, oh, 28 picofarad. Don't think so somehow, especially considering I didn't have anything between two and three there. So yeah. That sucks. Okay, well, that's uh, at least an easy fix. Let's find some 470, 10 volt, get the other two out, change them all. Oh, that one, the leg actually came out. Hmm. Looks like we're in luck. I recently ordered these uh, 470 10 volts. Just gonna clean up any leftover electrolyte with a uh, bit of alcohol swab action. Yeah, kind of dirty. And thankfully these uh, boards are marked really well with where the negative goes. So, that one will go there. This one will go here. And that one. There. Just bend the legs over. And get to soldering.
Should have done this first. Oh, geez. out of circuit as well. Last connectors. All right, look at these connectors. I've already put that one in. those pins a little bit. And this guy might be impossible to get. And camera, sorry if I'm blocking. There we go. Okay. Power it up and see what we get. Okay, standby light. Yeah, look at that. All right, so it's trying to do sled things. We've got the full display. That is awesome. All right. Uh, well, I mean, obviously we can't do much, so I'm going to have to put a lot more of this back together and uh, see how we go from there.
Ta-da! Took way too long to get this back together. Uh, and the reason that I was mostly hung up was the carriage here. It wasn't actually lifting from the base. The magnet was, I don't know, stuck or something. So I wasn't able to get the drive back in and that held me up for a while. But we're back together. The mechanism is working great. Uh, while I've got it apart, just before the final screws go in, I'm just going to give all of this a good cleaning, get rid of all my greasy fingerprints, but also get rid of all the stickies and the dirts and all that crap that's on here. for a test and I've got a little selection of uh, laser discs that I will try out. So I'm just going to grab, uh, let's go Two Frame Drive to Rabbit. Love that movie. Open it up. Mechanism looks great. Get this beastie out of the shell. God, look at that. <laughs> Girthy. So this will go in the top there. All right, and let's see what happens. Let's uh, try one of the other ones. Maybe this disc isn't good. It came from a known trusted source that they are working, so. Oh. NTSC. This is a PAL only player. <laughs> Did not notice that. Okay, uh, I have a bad feeling that the other discs that I got are also NTSC. Let me just double check that. Crap. Uh, yep, NTSC. Yep, NTSC. <laughs> well, it's got an FBI warning, so that's going to be NTSC. NTSC, and yeah. So. All the laser discs I have to test with are NTSC. Okay, well, let's try it. Um, let's try an audio CD. Audio CD. Let's see what we get. Well, at least tested the laser. Well, the audio CDs is working, so that's something. It's picked it up and it's detected that it is a CD. Trying to read the table of contents. It's got a table of contents, that's good. Do we have audio? Perfect. A little bit blown out. Very blown out. <laughs> Fast forward to my slam. I think that'll work nicely. Okay. Well, the laser works, so that's something. Well, at least the CD laser works. I don't know if it uses a different laser to read the laser discs or not. Um, don't know how else that I can test this. So, um, mm. excuse the tripod in my face. I just did a quick bit of research and I found that uh, with some other Pioneer models, I couldn't find anything specific for this one, but with some other Pioneer models, they do have a service mode. Um, that you can kind of boot it into, and in that mode it is sometimes possible to get it to read NTSC discs, even though it is only PAL, because sometimes the electronics are all there and they're just kind of disabled or something. I don't know. But found the exact test point that we're looking for, right there. And if we hook a lead up to it, which is easier said than done in this tight 
quarter. Oh boy. Jumper lead hooked up there. And then if we hook this to ground, so I'll just go straight to the chassis up here. And then, well, we just power it on. And what this does is it drops it into a service mode where it lights up all of the lights and it puts the screen into specific service mode. And then once it's booted, we take the clip off and it drops it into playable mode. So now we've got, I've already put the disc back in there so that I've got the um, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And all we should be able to do is uh, hit play and then I'll try and play the laser disc that's on there. Now it's only going to spin the disc so I have to play twice which will actually start it moving, like tracking the laser, and yeah, there you go. So, it can read it, it's in black and white, it's not very good. Um, let's scan, no, skip, guess not, but it is playing, in, yeah, hmm. It must be something to do with the the way that it's reading because I mean a laser disc is effectively it's analog video recorded onto the disc, so it's actually an NTSC signal written onto the disc and it's all it's doing it's playing that back. I'm honestly shocked that it's playing at the right speed. It might be a little bit slow because of the speed of NTSC versus PAL. Um, without sound, I don't know why we're not getting sound. Should be getting sound. Well, anyway. Not ideal, but we can see that the laser is is working. It's reading this disc just fine. Um, but this player, uh, I don't have any discs that can I can play on it. So, hmm. Moving on from that diagnostics fail, let's check out the uh, tape deck. There's no screws on the side. Or on the bottom, so it looks like we have to take the ones on the back off and then uh, the top should just slide back. I like how classic this deck is. No fancy just there's a control in and out for when you've got it in a, uh, a big tower unit and then you've just got uh, input for recording and output for playback. Perfect. Now we need to check our fuse as well because it turned on just fine. Quite a neat little setup. Just the one main board for everything. Hmm. We've got a big transformer down here, and there's our two tape mechanisms. Yeah, that's quite quite neat. Just having a, a cursory look at a lot of electrolytic capacitors, but I can't see any that look dangerous. And again, it's turning on. So we're not that fast. Wow, look at this linkage here for this switch. So that is a switch on the front panel. It's got, well, it's really hard to see, but this whole plastic comes in to join up there. Ah, that's awesome. Huh. Hmm, okay. Right, so I was going to go through and try and see exactly what this mechanism was doing. Um, but basically when I started looking in, I'm not sure how much of that you can see, but, uh, yeah, belt is dead. That's pretty much to be expected. So I think I'm just gonna, not even gonna bother testing it. I'm just gonna, oh yeah, it's just turned to muck. I'm just gonna uh, tear this entire mechanism down and um, see what belts we need to put in there. Hmm. 
Alright, let's first of all get this cassette out of there. Now, do we need to take the front panel off? That is a good question. It looks like there's four screws holding the mechanism to the front panel. So I think I will need to just take the front panel off and that should bring both mechanisms with it and then I can take those off from there. But otherwise, the other screw is all the way down in here and there's one all the way down in here that you can see behind this gear that's just impossible to get to. I'm, not gonna, I'm never getting a screwdriver in there. So let's get the front off. Before we go too far, let's um, oh, let's pull some cables, shall we? Right, I'm gonna have to cut these cable ties. Now I've just noticed that I've got a few connectors here that are a little bit identical, so I'm just going to mark them where they came from with different colours so that I know which one goes to which. And that one had three wires that goes like that, so I'll just mark the red like that. Yeah. That should let me get them back in the same spots. This one's going to be tricky because it's soldered down here and I don't know if it's soldered at the other end. And this one here just doesn't want to come out. So I don't know how to break that one loose. Yeah, one more. I think we may also need to take the feet off. Nope, we didn't. All right. Let's put that back in then. Okay. There we go. Two of those connectors. That's great. Hmm. Not ideal. Well, I guess we may it just need to work like so. All right. Now that we've got access, even though we're upside down, let's uh, take the mechanism off. So like I said, it looks like we should just be able to pop these four screws off the back and then the mechanism, or most of the mechanism, should come forward. So let's give it a shot. Were we lucky? So close. So it looks like I'm held up on the eject mechanism. There we go. And there is our mechanism. All right, could do it with a clean. It's pretty dusty in here. Now we can get a bit of a better look at the um, belts that are in here, and you can see this one here is just, yeah, I think it's oh, rubbery and, not rubbery, but kind of slimy and dunked. Yeah, that's gross. Which also sucks because it means I'm not going to be able to just measure it and find a new belt. I'm going to have to actually look up what the specs on this are and, uh, hmm, yeah. Okay, well, we're going to have to take 
this backplate off and the motor so that we can get to the mechanism underneath. It's going to be interesting. If we can get the screwdriver in this tiny, tiny screw. There we go. And I'll lift up there and that'll give us access to the screws here. like we're held up. We've got this spring. Let's get that off very carefully. We got a screw there. gets us nothing because of this board all right one more and just before I lose that screw a small one there we go. All right, there we go. Okay, so oh, we've got a lot of belts to look at here. So we got one on the motor up here. Oh boy. Ah. And we got one down here. out in one piece might be able to measure it oh yeah okay now we're talking oh it's sticky and then we've got the disintegrated one on the, the capstan here is this the capstan no I think this is the yeah I don't know I don't know what my terminology though let's uh yeah Ah, it's just turned into complete muck. Absolute mush. Yeah, I'm gonna have to dig all that out. Great. All right. You can see it's just absolute, just turned into a paste. So that's what's happened with these old belts. And we're gonna have to clean, clean and clean because we can't put a new belt in while there's old belts still in these treads. Like, look at that. Yeah, so I'm gonna have to get down deep in there. There's some alcohol and some really fine Q-tips. And dig all this mush out. Yuck. Well, it's the next day and I uh, figured out how to get the connector out. So I've just got the drive and I've been able to put the uh, the, the mechanism, the, the main unit off to the side. And I've had this belt just sitting on my bench overnight and it's just <laughs> completely degraded even further. And now it's stuck to the wood. So awesome. 
Uh, I was going to use that to measure, but now that we've broken it, I don't think I can do that anymore. So, we're going to need a different process. Hmm. Okay, so, I don't know the length of the belts because, well, they're in pieces and I can't measure pieces glued together. Um, so what we'll need to do is figure out exactly what belts we will need. Now I could look in the service manual for this, but I, you know, that's cheating. Let's not do that. Let's figure it out for ourselves, you know? Um, so what we can do is I've got some just butcher's twine here, but any, you know, thin string about the size of the belt, existing belt will work and just a red Sharpie. So we can take our string and we wrap it around basically the path of that belt will have taken. So there's a pulley under there, and there's a pulley here, and we need to be really careful here. Cross them over like so, and that is our belt path. Now, while that's there, oh, this is easier if I had another set of hands, what we can do, there we go, nice and taut, we can mark that there and that there. Double check that line. Yeah, so we then have one mark here and one mark here somewhere. As soon as I find it, there it is. So that, from my thumbs to thumbs, were those two red marks that I just made, is our belt uh, length or circumference. So when that's wrapped around, that gives us our diameter. But yeah, that's how we mark out the belt. So then I'll just cut that off here. And then we can do it for the other one. Okay, here we are. We've got a measure. Measure. And we've got a ruler. And let's measure. So, the first belt we estimate to be uh, about 190. So, I'd always go less than that. So, well, let's say it's 100 and yeah, 195 or so, you know, somewhere around that area. And the other one is going to be uh, around 170. So from 190, about 190 and 170. So let's go and have a look at what belts that we can uh, find for that. All right, so yeah, we are on the Wagner website uh, and we're under the cassette belt. So this Wagner is a um, supplier. They're an electronics wholesaler in Sydney, Australia, where I am. So this is where I get my belts from. Alternatively, you could just find a kit on eBay and wait a bunch, but I can go here tomorrow and just pick up belts over the counter. Uh, so we are looking for not flat square section 1.2. There we go. Yeah, so they've got 0.8, 1 mil. Uh, 1.4 and 2 mil, but yeah, we want the 1.2. And then uh, we can look down below at the sizes that we've got. So we need to keep going. Uh, so we're looking for somewhere around 160. So 160 or 154, they sound kind of good. Now, kind of want to go a little bit shorter because the string's not perfect and the belt you do want it to have some tension like it doesn't need to stretch uh, and it shouldn't stretch the belt sh definitely shouldn't stretch but they should be tight so if we were measuring 160 we'd probably want to or 170 or whatever it was we would probably want to go down a little bit so i think the 154 would be perfect for that so let's put a pin in that let's just add to cart um continue and then the other one was 195 i think it was so uh, the next available size is 188, just because 198 is too big. 188 sounds perfect, so let's add that to cart. So, let's see how close I got. A um, little bit of research. Let's do some research. We have the uh, service manual for the CT-W601R up on the Internet Archive, which is awesome. Um, and we're looking at the mechanism unit for deck one. And if you go to the next page, we have the mechanism unit for deck two. This is obviously the exploded view. Um, but we can see uh, we have two belts. So there's this one on the main motor here, right there. And then there's another one here on the auxiliary drive. So there's that one that's that that's that's a belt <laughs> and it kind of just, you know, goes around stuff. But uh, we can look and see this one here is item number 24. And if you look at the list, item number 24, belt. And then we get a pack number, a part number. Um, but it doesn't tell you what 
size it is. So that's not a super useful service manual. And the same with the main belt here, 45. Go down to 45, belt main. And so, yeah, we've got REB1159 and REB1158. Thankfully, Google to the rescue, and we found a supplier that has, you know, that specifically calls out that they sell the RAB1158 and 1159 replacement belts, you know, the same same spec. And we can see that the 1158, so this is the smaller belt, has a specification of 6 inches and 152 centimetres, or sorry, 152 millimetres, 15.2 centimetres uh, in length, and the 1159 is uh, 7.4 inch or 188 centimetres, 188 millimetres. How does that compare? So we looked at a 60 by 1.2, so 188. So that one is absolutely 100% spot on. And the other one that we looked at was the 49, which is a 154, and that would be a 152. So we were two mil off. So it's not too bad. I, I'm pretty happy with that. So yeah, uh, like I said, uh, I'm gonna stop by Wagner tomorrow, probably on my way home from work, pick up a couple of these belts. Uh, well four of them because it looks like there's two per. We can confirm that as well. Let's do that. If we look at this is deck one, let's go over to deck two and it has the same belts. So there's the main drive, there's the excel, uh, the separate drive and they are 24 and 45, 24 and 45. Yes, yeah, so it's just the four belts. So double check if we just search for the word belt. Yeah, just only two belts per. So yeah, Let's get uh, ordering and uh, picking up and replacing. Okay, well, we've got new belts. So we've got the uh, 60 by 1.2, this is the 188 mil, and we've got our 49 by 1.2, this is the 154 mil belt. And I've got the both the units uh, all deconstructed now, so this is all nice and loose back here for the other drive, and all the um, old belt viscera, I guess you could call it, uh, is cleaned up and ready to go. Oh, and also where I got this from also had the um, the one farad 5.5 volt cap, the backup cap for the laser disc. So I'll probably uh, install that sometime soon when I tear down that unit again. But uh, yeah, let's get these belts in. First of all, we've got to put in the smaller belt and that just goes around the wheel at the back here and then around ah, Blimey, let's do that again Okay, so first of all, let's do the smaller, the 154 mil belt. So that goes around, there's a little wheel uh, on the bottom, uh, a pulley on the bottom of this bigger wheel, and then it goes around the, oops, let's first of all get that washer back in place. Come on. All right, well, let's see it there. That goes around this pulley like so. So that's there now. Let's get that washer back in place. Ah, down in the works. There we go. Okay. And then, so the big belt is a little bit trickier to get on. Um, what we need to do is route it around this wheel, between this wheel and this wheel, and then around the drive belt, but uh, the drive motor, but obviously we can't get that down until everything's in place. So let's first of all get that there and then we'll pinch it up and put it in between the belts here and that should ride in the tracks on this wheel and just just there on this wheel and then this belt will come up here. Now I'm just gonna plonk it on this little post for now just so I can handle it and you can kind of see the routing that it needs to take there now so that when you turn these wheels they'll these will turn in opposite directions. Uh, and then, yeah, we need to get this down in that little gap right here. So, what I think I'll do is I'll probably try to hold that like that. 
I'm just gonna grab this off, get my finger there, spread it out a bit, plonk that down into place, make sure that it's in its right position, and then try to, you can barely see, but try and let it go, yeah, so that it, that belt is now on the motor, and that's it. Yeah, cool. So now we'll just screw this down so it doesn't move, and uh, get on to doing the other ones. Well, I've got it out, might as well just give the, um, the mech, the heads, a little bit of a wipe down with some IPA on a cotton bud, same as the rollers here. So they are clearly a little bit filthy. No, it's not too bad. back together, I guess. Okay, just a couple of screws in place, and let's just check that the eject mechanism is working. Beautiful. All right, let's get the rest in. Now let's try to remember how this mess went back together. Okay. 
this one I did mark, so that's the green one that goes to this green stripe there. And then there should be a matching red one for this red one there. Good. There's two pin one down here. Three wires here, and I marked the red one there. Like that. And then it can go locking down. There we go. And then, we just have this one. There's one more there. That's this one. So it can go underneath. Look into that. Let's flip this up to do the last ones. Okay. All right. Beautiful. Let's just pop that screw back in the bottom to hold the front on. And these ones on the side. All right, we're back up, powered on, and we've got our uh, free War of the Worlds tape. Uh, let's uh, let's see if it works. So let's try deck number one. I mean, it's playing, but it sounds very slow. Ooh. Okay. And it's doing something weird. Oh, and it's not playing in reverse at all. Okay. That's odd. And it seems to be jumping around. Okay, let's try... Uh... Look two. Oh, that sounds a lot better. Actually, that sounds perfect. In reverse. between tracks. Tape counter's working. Hope this doesn't get content matched. Yeah, this seems good. The torment was ended. The people scattered over the country, desperate, leaders starved. Thousands Sounds perfect. And the reverse. Yeah, the reverse is working excellently on this. So there's still something wrong with this deck. Um, this may be why it wasn't used, although it's good that this is the playback only, whereas this is the record and playback, which means I can still use this uh, to record from the auxiliary input. Uh, I do need to test that though, but I don't have any blank tapes at the moment, so that will be here for another day. Yeah, no, I think this is going to need a little bit more work, but I don't quite have the time for it at the moment. I just wanted to get mostly get this up and working, uh, which, I mean, it half is. You know, we've got a full unit. We've got at least one tape deck working. Uh, new belts in this one, but this this uh, head mech, this mechanism still seems like it's going to need some work, uh, which kind of sucks, but 
can't all be easy fixes. So yeah, let's get this guy back together. Give this a good clean up as well. Pretty filthy. Well, that's the two Pioneer units, the Laserdisc and the Tape Deck. Uh, they turned out pretty well for 20 bucks a pop, I am not complaining. We still have some issues. I need to buy some PAL laser discs for one, and for the other, I still need to figure out what is up with the playback on this first tape deck. I think that's gonna be something to do with the little cam gear mechanism that operates everything mechanically. Um, but they both look good, they both work, mostly, and I think they'll be an excellent addition to my entertainment unit. Anyway, hope you enjoyed. Thanks for watching.